comply for urban scale energy modeling and and more it's 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 about like how what are what can you do with pollination and energy modeling in general and then we have q a the questions can be related to the topic or can be anything related to pollination uh, you can use the com uh, comment section uh, for asking any of the questions that we have. Do you have any question before we get us started? Anyone? I think everyone can see the screen. So one thing is we record this event. You probably saw the recording just showed up. Uh, so like, yeah, be aware of that. With that, let's get us started. So what's pollination? Uh, pollination is an ecosystem of tools and that helps you to go from design to actionable data quickly. And how do we do that? We're doing that by eliminating the time consuming steps of the process. And that kind of makes us different from some of the other solutions. We are basically trying to address the things that no one really wants to talk about and we think is the, is the source of the problem. So how we are doing that is by designing this ecosystem of tools which are both desktop and cloud application. Uh, on the desktop side, we have three CAD plugins. The reason for CAD plugins is to help you prepare your model, debug your model. Uh, the three plugins that we have have different use cases. The Rhino plugin is mostly for like building the full model, editing everything, uh, uh, QA, QC, and a lot of flexibility there. Grasshopper plugin is mainly to help you integrate with all the ladybug tools and stuff that you already have and help you with setting up and running parametric studies. And the Revit plugin, the main value proposition right now is just get a clean model out of Revit quickly. Then uh, from the CAD plugins, we all of the CAD plugins generate the same uh, analytical model in HPJSON format, which gives a seamless interoperability between the tools that we have. We have recipes, which are the useful units of logic. Chris will show a couple of them today, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. You will see what is a recipe and why, is it, why it is important. Uh, we have a web interface to help QHUC, to help with all the collaboration. That we think is one of the major reasons and bottlenecks of, of working together quickly and effectively. And then of course we have the simulation execution, both locally and we have cloud computing. So if you want to run it, uh, on pollination cloud. So this is the whole ecosystem that we are working on and we are designing. Why we're doing this? Because we want to move you from this way of collaboration between architects and engineers that basically one waits for another uh, for a very long time and then we send files and we have to clean the model uh, for a long time on the uh, consultant side. And of course it makes a gap, which we call this two week with no feedback, the two week feedback effect. Uh, which results in us not really using the, the analysis effectively and integrated with the design process. So what we are trying to do is by bringing pollination here and with the ecosystem that we built, one on the consultant side, now you can deploy your recipes. Uh, on the uh, architect side, designer side, you basically send your analytical model to pollination. You don't send your full Laravit model, your full Rhino model to your consultant, so they don't have to clean up. Basically, everyone does what they're good at, and pollination stays in the middle to help you with the whole collaboration process. So you get things done on time and without wasting budget, both during the design process and after. And yes, people can take time off, and that shouldn't matter in 2021 for you to be able to run your simulations. So what are the updates? Uh, these are weekly updates. If you haven't been here, like we upload the videos to YouTube so you can go and see the updates from uh, previous weeks. But uh, I'll do it for every product that we have, uh, starting from Pollination Rhino plugin. Uh, we worked on QA and QC uh, during this week to improve them. It's already in a good place, but now it's even better. So previously on Pollination User Meetup, you have seen this, so we had this a command for checking adjacency. You know, like you always get these models, energy models that look fine, but then you start checking them and they're just like not fine. Like you run simulation and something goes wrong and you don't know why. So now you can quickly, and I don't know why the quality is so low, but you can quickly uh, figure out and find the places that the points are very close, the zones are very close, but they don't match. And this was like, made a very good impression. People used it, people loved it. But we got a lot of model and then we realized maybe when we get to 3D, it's actually really late for fixing stuff. 
So what we did, we added a whole new package for 2D workflows. And as much as we love people to work in 3D and share HPJSON files and you know, lose not data, but there's a reality that how people work today. And we still share a lot of files in 2D format. And like there's PDF, people redraw. And so how can we help you to fix those stuff? One command that we added, it's called PO check 2D plan, which is similar to the 3D plan check, but this time does it in 2D. So if you have all your plans on top of each other, you can select them. It basically finds the points that are between this threshold. And if you click on one of them, it basically goes and zooms on that one. So you can fix it. So you can quickly fix the stuff in 2D before ex extruding them. So you avoid the issues in 3D. The other command that we uh, added is PO check 2D ortho. This one helps you to find the lines that are supposed to be orthogonal, but they're not. And you can see they're not easy to identify. So one of the things is like when you get these models that are very clean, but they're not really clean, you think everything is good, but it's not really good. And being able to cache them at this point will save you a lot of time when you make it 3D, because this is like just drag those points and just, you know, uh, make them orthogonal instead of like going in 3D, then move edge, then you have to share the edge between zones and all those. This one also has a auto fix for you. So it's like, uh, the Google search that if you feel lucky, then we take care of autofix. So autofix, the reason for autofix is we usually know that the mistake is where the line is longer. So if you have a horizontal line, usually it should move in, in Y direction. If you have a vertical line or close to vertical line, it should move in the X direction. So you can align it here by using this, going one by one, or you can autofix uh, the stuff. One thing that some of you might thinking, what if my plan is not 90 degrees is like it's in a different plane. You can use this world X, Y input to change the plane. So you don't have to rotate your plan to work with it. So that's another plan. Then the next thing that we added was we saw these models that come in that just like during the, uh, when people traced on the plan, it were supposed to be on a grid, but it's not on a grid anymore. So you get all this smaller differences that people are, that the things are off like we, half a grid size or something. So we added this new command called PO rebuild 2D plans. What it does basically, it selects all your plans that you have, you run this command and it aligns your whole plan on the grid based on the grid size. So you can say my grid size is 0 0.1 or 0 0.5. And it gives you a preview before you accept it. So now you can see this original line was here, but it needed to be here. Uh, so that that move, actually, I, I my bad. <laughs> it, it was here, but it's supposed to be here. So this is the fixed one. The, the bold uh, pink one is the wrong one. So basically this, this fix happens for you automatically. Again, like this is a command that can save you hours of like going floor by floor and trying to fix it. The other thing that we added to Rhino is uh, supporting invalid rooms. The reason this is very important is now, finally, you have an editor that, for example, if you have a GBXML file someone exported from somewhere and it just has all these errors, you don't have to go and say, okay, I have to redraw everything from scratch, right? You can bring it in, and while this is an invalid one, you can isolate and you can go to edit mode and try to fix it. We have a note here for you that says what is the error. It can be a tiny edge. It can be that your zone or, or your room is not closed. So you can go inside, uh, you, you can basically fix it. The good approach and the difference between this approach, excuse me, and, and fixing the BRAP or geometry is this keeps all the metadata. So if you have all the metadata for room already and you fix it like this, you're not going to lose those metadata. You just fix the geometry, the metadata in the zone level or in the room level stays there. Um, this is another one. And then finally, we added the command called rebuild rooms. And this is helpful when you get a model like that. Uh, the things that Rebuild Rooms does is it basically fixes all the faces that are coplanar but are splitted like this. It removes um, solve adjacency if you have wrong solve adjacency. It's also very useful if you run solve adjacency and then the model uh, creates some solve adjacency which has not cracked. And usually like someone else does that and sends you the model so you cannot undo. This way you can just clean the whole uh, solve adjacency and start from scratch. Again, we added all these commands that I just mentioned because we had to fix some models, some sample models that people sent, and you need these commands. We are 
like to say like what's coming next. Uh, we are working on like making it easier for you to update your model or sync your model. Uh, so many people ask for, okay, what, what happens if I bring a model from Revit to Rhino? I start working, doing all this, adding all the construction set, the schedule, everything, and then the Revit model changes. How do I update this model? So right now our answer has been, if you know which rooms changed, just select them, make a partial export and import it here, right? But even when you do that, the first thing that you want is you want to use the properties that you already set for the room that you had before, because usually only the geometry is changing on your Revit side. So with this match room properties, you can quickly match properties. It's similar to Rhino match properties, so you don't have to redo the job. But we are also working on a PO sync model command that helps you like sync them. Uh, so you just sync your current model with the new model that comes in. When the command is ready, we will present it here. So uh, that, should, that should wrap up all this QA, QC stuff that you need to do for your Rhino model. Sorry for the background noise, if you can hear it. Then uh, on Polynesian Revit side, uh, what we did, we made the huge release. Now it's publicly available from Discourse if you want to download it. Um, we are already getting a lot of good feedback. Unfortunately, with the Revit model, the, the challenge is usually the, the Revit, uh, the models are shared privately with us. And uh, so many people don't see stuff that's happening. We have to tell to everyone. But if you can share it publicly, that will be great. Otherwise, we'll be happy to help you with, with fixing stuff one uh, by one um, at this stage of the product. Then finally, we are making a change on Pollination Web App. As you know, we are getting closer to the end of the beta access, and we are going to uh, transit to paid period. There is a chance that we have to extend the beta access process, so don't worry about it uh, right now. If you want to test it, you can still you still have a lot of time for testing it for free. Uh, but this is a start for that transition. So in settings under your profile account, either personal or your team account, organization account, you now will see what are the resources that you, you're using. And as I said, for the beta testing, you have unlimited access, which is great. Enjoy it. And we are also adding this usage dashboard to the setting page. So you will be seeing how much you have used already. One thing to keep in mind is if you see the numbers right now, the num don't trust the numbers for a week or so until we ran a script on all the history uh, of what you have run on pollination. But this, we hope this will be helpful for you when you want to make the decision of buying a, a paid account, you know where you stand and which one makes more sense uh, for you to transit to. With that, I'll hand it over to uh, Chris for doing the rest of the presentation, unless there is a question here that I need to respond to right away. We haven't seen any questions in the chat um, during your updates, Mustafa. But if anyone has any questions while Chris is pulling up his um, presentation, feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, I think Chris, you can get started. Good. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, so, uh, as Mustafa said, I'm going to take you on a bit of a, a tour through some of the energy modeling capabilities that we have uh, integrated into pollination right now, and we're going to steadily work our way over to uh, Dragonfly capabilities towards the end of uh, of uh, the kind of demo presentation I'm showing you here. Uh, but to go back to kind of the original impetus that uh, uh, you know inspired us to do to pick this topic for this user meetup, um, there was a uh, one of the issues raised in a previous meetup was that uh, because energy simulations aren't necessarily uh, the most parallelizable type of calculation that you can run, uh, the kind of question was what are what are the real use cases for running uh, the, uh, energy models on a on a cloud platform like pollination. Uh, so we're going to start today with just a simple honeybee energy model, just a simple uh, uh, seven-zone uh, single-family home that you probably, if you've seen any of my tutorials, have seen me probably use a lot <laughs> uh, because this is my, my mother-in-law's house. But um, but yeah, but I'm going to use it to showcase some of the um, some of the features we have when you when you run it just a kind of basic honeybee energy simulation on pollination uh, right now. So. This model was created with uh, with just the Ladybug Tools Grasshopper plugin, but it could have just as easily been created with the Rhino plugin that Mustafa showed you earlier. 
Uh, and importantly, so the main thing I want to show you with this is that uh, uh, basically our annual energy use recipe. Uh, uh, Mustafa explained basically what recipes were earlier, but to kind of give you like a uh, an overview, uh, a recipe is just, I mean, it's it's like a component like you see here, but it's basically an entire workflow of, of, a, uh, of a simulation that you want to execute, uh, either locally or on the cloud. Uh, and you can see if you grab the pollination uh, get recipe component uh, and you select, you'll see we have several recipes already on the platform. Uh, the one that I'm using here is just called annual energy use. Uh, and you can see that um, we have several uh, inputs for this. A lot of you, if you've used this recipe in the past, you probably realize that uh, this component or this recipe has kind of doubled in size. We added a lot of new features and inputs to it. Uh, really, in the last few days, this is, this is the version that's on our, uh, the, the pollination platform right now, though. Uh, and to walk quickly through some of the new stuff that we added, and literally, I should say, we just pushed this like a couple hours ago uh, to our platform. Uh, so this is fresh, uh, hot off the press uh, type of type of uh, features. Uh, so previously, we had the ability to connect up our model that we want to simulate. We have the EPW file we want to use our weather file for energy simulation, uh, and we we recommend you know uh, putting connecting a DDY file to make sure that sizing calculation that happens to size the HVAC equipment before an energy simulation uh, that that gets uploaded to pollination. Uh, but new this time, we have uh, the ability to connect up simulation parameters. Uh, so simulation parameters, if you've worked with the Ladybug Tools Grasshopper plugin, this is what allows you to customize what outputs you want to request, uh, the run period of the simulation, if you don't want to run it for the whole year. Uh, you can add things like holidays and all these other uh, uh, types of uh, things that really customize the, the simulation itself and aren't really a part of the design model. Uh, so we have full support for that. Uh, we've added uh, additional strings, which is, uh, I mean, it's an advanced feature for people uh, who know Energy Plus well. But this basically allows you to connect up whatever IDF text you want, any of that raw language that Energy Plus understands. Uh, and you can in incorporate that into your simulation. So that's now fully supported on here. In this case, I'm just requesting like an extra type of output uh, you know, using this. Uh, we have uh, we have this new uh, uh, option for visualization variables, which I, I'm going to explain to you a little bit later. Uh, but this basically allows you to preview sort of any of the energy plus output variables that are on the zone or surface level. Uh, you can get a report with uh, with that data. I'm just going to connect up. I'm going to request uh, looking at the heating energy of this model here, uh, and you'll see in a second when I run this uh, simulation what uh, what that produces. Uh, and then lastly, probably one of the, the features that uh, we're most proud of to, to add in the last few days are uh, the ability to connect any number of open studio measures. Um, so for those of you who, who aren't familiar with measures, measures are essentially like little snippets of uh, script written in Ruby and leveraging uh, the Open Studio SDK. Uh, and the Open Studio SDK, it's, uh, it's a pretty much fully featured SDK for Energy Plus. So you can practically customize any aspect of the of the simulation that you want using measures. Um, you know whether that's adding in very specific types of HVAC systems or adding in special types of reports. Uh, really, anything that we haven't exposed on the UI that is that is uh, possible to do in Energy Plus, you can do with measures. Uh, and maybe I'll just also plug quickly that you know the uh, NREL, the the kind of uh, the organization that is uh, maintaining Open Studio uh, has several uh, measures publicly available that for download uh, that you can search for the building components library here. Uh, so when you download those, those will just be the folder that contains the Ruby scripts, uh, just like what you see here. So I have a measure that uh, adds electric vehicle charging, uh, which is, uh, as, as we all know, something that's becoming much more popular these days. Uh, and so if I wanted to account for that electrical vehicle charging within my energy simulation, all that I really have to do, I download that measure from NREL, I connect that up to this, uh, to this measure component, uh, and that's what allows me to, it loads all the basically the input arguments for that measure so that I can say uh, I want to specify 100% electrical vehicles for, this, uh, for my mother-in-law's house here that I'm about to simulate. Uh, and you know, maybe I just realized that just to make it easier for you guys to, to know um, which components I'm referencing here, I'm gonna use my this little bifocals plugin. So yeah, so we have the measure loaded up here. We can connect that now into our recipe, uh, and then pretty much then we can just we're ready to send the uh, this this recipe uh, over to pollination. Uh, and I just I need to log in again quickly, uh, just for this demo. Uh, let me see. I'm gonna sign out and sign back in just to 
make sure that I uh, I'm, everything's all synced with my account. All right, and then I uh, then when I hit pollinate, basically you'll see as it's preparing the model, it's uploading all these inputs that I specified here. So it's uploading that model, it's uploading the uh, you know the measure that I have here, the EPW, all of that's basically going into this energy simulation. Uh, and then I can check this job on pollination uh, by connecting it up here and going to check this job on pollination cloud. Um, so we'll see. I know this simulation takes about like you know three to four minutes to run. Uh, right now, and I can check the status of it here. Uh, to save us some time in the presentation, you see it's already scheduled the, the run simulation step. Uh, but to save us some time, I'm going to just jump to a, uh, a version of this that I ran before the call here. Uh, so this is basically what it's going to look like when it's, uh, when it's finished, uh, when that simulation is done. Uh, and you see, um, you know, compared to, let's say, a radiant simulation where you'd have this very complex graph of seeing uh, the different nodes scale uh, and then bring the results back together, the energy use one is very, very uh, simplified. There's really only two steps of just running the simulation. Uh, and then there, you, there's a post-processing step where we compute the EUI so that we can get the actual end use intensity. Um, but uh, so yeah, so this I mean, as we could, we, I said earlier, the the calculation for energy plus isn't really that highly parallelizable, uh, and maybe to just say the reason for that is because uh, unlike radiance, where you know having one radiance sensor doesn't influence the you know the result that the a sensor right next to it's going to have, uh, that's not necessarily true for uh, zones and rooms in the energy plus, uh, and that's because heat can flow right from one room to another to another. Uh, and so you can't really just run necessarily each room uh, as a separate uh, uh, energy calculation. You really need everything to be integrated into one uh, one CPU to be able to share all that information back and forth. Uh, but we'll come back to that in a second. For now, I just want to show you some other possible uses that even though this calculation isn't parallelized, uh, there are still very good reasons to run it on the cloud platform. Well, for one, uh, you know, it's kind of rare that you'll run just one simulation with energy use. and uh, you can set up parametric models with a grasshopper plugin, and uh, certainly each each you know simulation you're running, uh, each option of that parametric run is going to run on a separate CPU. Uh, so you can still take a big advantage of the cloud computing resources of pollination when you do those types of parametric runs. Uh, but even let's say if you're just running a single simulation like this, uh, there are still really nice things that you get in the web platform here uh, that you you won't necessarily be able to get uh, if you're only running it locally. Uh, and that's for one. You'll see some of the outputs that we have here now from this uh, from this this energy simulation. And one of them is an EUI uh, report, basically a very simple JSON object that just tells you the result of this study was that the energy use intensity was was this was X. Uh, and you know, and it gives you a breakdown of of what the different end uses of that were for uh, uh, for various pieces of. Um, uh, of, of energy use. And you can see, wow, by a long shot, this uh, electric vehicle charging, maybe I should have tweaked some of the parameters of that, but that's using like uh, 10 times the amount of energy of the whole house, I could see. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, but that exterior equipment, that's the electric vehicle in that case. Uh, and these units are all in kilowatt hours because I didn't change the, uh, uh, if you see back here, there's an input for units so you can switch between SI and IP. Uh, so if you're a fan of KBDU per square foot, you can use that as well. Um, let's see, what else? I mean, I have the model HPJS on here, which I can I can easily preview if I wanted to, uh, right? This is that same model that I uh, uh, I, uh, I just have in Rhino Grasshopper. I can QAQC it right here. Uh, but probably one of the really exciting things that we have now is that you can also get now a HTML report. Uh, and the way that you have to do this right now, we're eventually going to make it so that you can just click the HTML and it will pop straight up uh, in your browser. Uh, but right now, you just need to download the file. And, uh, and open it up right here. And so this is a summary report that we've gotten from, uh, from the, the energy simulation here. Uh, and you can see it's got a lot of nice interactive charts and graphs. There's an annual overview. There's a model summary that tells you basically the, the square footage or meterage. Uh, right? the, uh, you have a lot of, lot of different design conditions in here. Uh, you have nice monthly overviews of, of different uh, uh, types of, of end uses, like natural gas. And uh, I mean, yeah, again, we can see this, uh, the, the electric vehicles kind of dominated this, this simulation. So I probably might want to go back and, and tweak some of those variables here. But yeah, but you have envelope summaries, space heat. And so the nice thing is that because you have this report on the pollination platform, right, it's very easy to just send your team members the link to this, uh, this page. And they can also look over the report and say, like, OK, I think you maybe made some uh, not some great assumptions for this electric vehicle charging. Uh, maybe go back and try some of the different 
uh, other other <laughs> uh, other possible, uh, you know, maybe tweak some of those input variables uh, to get it uh, to be more realistic, right? So so again, this helps with collaboration like this. We also have uh, you heard me mention earlier that we have these visualization variables now uh, as an input for the recipe. And the way that those work is that there's a visual.html report that you get out of uh, out of this recipe now. Uh, and if we download that and open that in our browser, you'll see that it gives us a nice uh, you know in browser view of our model that pretty much anyone, whether they have Rhino Grasshopper or, you know or not, they can load this in their browser and see uh, some of the results. So right now, I mean, this is what the the model looks like, but you can toggle off the shading or the roofs if you want to see different uh, different parts of the model. Uh, you can color things by surface type or normal or boundary condition or construction. Uh, and then very importantly, uh, to go back to those visualization variables, you can color it with data. Uh, and so in this case, we're coloring it with that heating, that sensible heating energy uh, for, for the zones that I, uh, um, that I mentioned earlier that I plugged into this recipe. Uh, and you can choose some of a few different color schemes. And importantly, you could also scroll through the hours of the day and see how, you know, at these different time steps of the simulation, how that heating energy is changing, right? So this really allows you to kind of dig in there, uh, and, you know, we can look at different kind of days of the year, right, as well as, uh, you know, as, uh, as hours of the day, uh, and allows you to really kind of dig into the, the data and QAQC stuff. And again, because this report is on HTML on pollination, uh, right, it, it allows you to collaborate with your team members in a way that you couldn't do it just running this all locally. Uh, maybe just also show right that we have like surface temperatures on a surface by surface basis um, uh, Right that you can you can request basically I, I should say there's a limitation right now where we really only uh, accept either one visualization variable or or you have to kind of format this uh, uh, If you want to have multiple visualization variables in the in the report uh, But I can I can showcase that later right now and we're definitely in the future I think we'll add support to connect up a list of whatever variables you want here Okay. All right. So that kind of gives you an overview of just running a honeybee simulation, um, and and you know both the benefits and the limitations of trying to run honeybee models like this. Uh, but now I'll, I'll kind of I'm going to track backtrack on myself and say that um, you know even though this energy simulation that we ran here was not very parallelizable and all everything had to be run on one worker, there are certainly ways of trying to break up energy simulations in order to you know run different parts of the calculation on different machines. Uh, it's very, it's extremely difficult to do that, like temporally. For example, if you, you know, if you want to run each month on a different CPU, uh, ultimately that usually doesn't end up, uh, in, you know, speeding up the calculation all that much because Energy Plus, because the way it runs, each time step of the simulation depends on the previous one, and so even when you break it up like that into, let's say, run each month on a different CPU, uh, it, it's ultimately not that much faster because it needs to warm up and and kind of get the simulation in a state where the previous time step makes sense. So, but what we can do is break up the model spatially, uh, and so it's it was. Primarily and, and partially, I should say, actually, for that reason that we kind of invented uh, uh, the dragonfly schema, uh, which is essentially just an abstraction on top of Honeybee that makes it particularly easy to run and scale very large models uh, for energy simulation. So I'm going to walk you through just the basics of what the dragonfly schema is and how it's organized right now, and then I'll show you some examples of simulating dragonfly models uh, for energy use. Um, so. The basic premise is that uh, there are, you know, a lot of the times we're not necessarily working from these uh, clean, closed solids of individual rooms like we would in Honeybee. Uh, and as Mustafa said earlier, we're working from something like a 2D floor plan or we're working from building solids or we're working from building footprints or something like that. Uh, and so Dragonfly has these kind of streamlined workflows so that you can create the buildings just from those 2D floor surfaces, uh, essentially, right, so that you... You don't necessarily have to worry about the complexity of everything in, in 3D. Um, the kind of, I mean, the one big limitation you're accepting with this is that, um, you know, essentially every room has to be an extruded floor plate when you work with Dragonfly. Uh, and so that does mean that it's not appropriate for all buildings. Uh, certainly if you have, you know, certain types of crazy roof geometries, that may not be the best thing to, to model with Dragonfly. But a lot of the buildings that we create uh, easily easily fit into that, um, uh, that kind of... Uh, uh, description. And so, you know, if you do build your model with Dragonfly, there are a lot of advantages you can take of by structuring your model with just these 2D floor surfaces. Uh, so we also, within Dragonfly, we have streamlined workflows for working from building solids, right? So we can just take that solid and automatically divvy it up into a bunch of floor plates, basically intersecting a plane, 
along the height of your your building there. Uh, and of course, you know, we can work easily from building footprints. So like we have streamlined workflows for getting from GeoJSON or a lot of these spatial data formats that are really just building footprints. Um, so OK, so these are the, the ways of working through uh, Dragonfly models. And the two I'm going to show you today, I'm going to show you a rooms to stories to buildings workflow, and I'm going to show you a from buildings footprints workflow to kind of give you a sense of the extremes of the, the ways of working with this. Uh, but probably I know one of the most popular ways of doing this is with from building solid. So um, yeah, so I'd recommend kind of looking into that after the, the meetup here. All right, so to kind of go over like the structure of the Dragonfly schema and kind of how it relates to the Honeybee like detailed 3D schema, Dragonfly, again, all those rooms are just 2D floor plates. Uh, and those 2D floor plates can be joined into a Dragonfly story object. So basically, you have these objects. You can assign multipliers to stories to say basically that this story repeats, you know, four times over the height of the building, and that way you don't need to represent the geometry, you know, uh, in detail multiple times. So that makes the file size very compact. It also makes it much easier to if you just want to run a simulation using multipliers, which basically will only simulate this geometry once and then just multiply it by a factor instead of simulating each and every detailed geometry. Um, and again, so so those stories then can get by, combined into a dragonfly building object uh, that that uh, that houses those stories and basically uh, again allows you to set certain properties on that building level. So this is kind of a very simple schematic uh, diagram of what the dragonfly model looks like. You have buildings; those are composed of stories; those are composed of room 2Ds, and you can also add whatever extra context shade geometry you know in 3D uh, into your models like that. Um, okay. And so what else? And so to show the kind of relationship of, of Dragonfly to Honeybee, I mean, in Honeybee, we have these five primary geometry objects of rooms that are made of faces. Faces can host uh, apertures and doors or windows and doors. And then all of these can have shades applied to them, uh, right? But if I want to make a, uh, establish a hierarchy uh, of, uh, you know, in order to create stories and buildings and rooms, I'm really just managing lots and lots of lists and lists of lists, basically, with Honeybee in order to, to kind of create something similar to a Dragonfly object. So that's where Dragonfly comes in. It makes it particularly easy. The, the kind of finest level of detail you'll find in Dragonfly is that room. There really aren't any uh, individual faces or, or windows in Dragonfly. We just represent those with uh, basically with, with simple parameters like the ceiling height of the room or the glazing ratio of the window. Um, and again, so there's every Dragonfly model can be mapped to a Honeybee model. And you'll see me do this uh, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but basically, yeah, that Dragonfly models, the way that we simulate them is essentially by translating to Honeybee and then using, you know, from Honeybee, we go to Energy Plus or Radiance or whatever engine you want to simulate. Uh, so essentially, yeah, Dragonfly is just a way of, uh, you know, it's an abstraction, it's a hierarchy that allows you to more easily work on this larger scale uh, so that you're not worried about, you know, this, this nitty-gritty detail of individual shade objects. Uh, you, can, you can work on this layer of abstraction. OK, uh, and again, just like a disclaimer I said earlier, like not all models are appropriate to model with Dragonfly. So this shows you that, uh, you know, the common Revit sample file, uh, you know, when it's exported from our Revit plugin in Honeybee versus Dragonfly. Uh, and you can see probably for Dragonfly, it's, uh, you know, it was a little too much of an oversimplification uh, really for, certainly for something like a daylight analysis. I mean, maybe if you're running a very streamlined energy analysis, this might be appropriate. Uh, but really, this, a model like this is probably much better represented in Honeybee. But with that, let me kind of show you an example of a building that would be uh, uh, basically a good a good sample to show uh, with um, uh, let's see with with Dragonfly. So in this case, let me zoom extents so we can see. So I have a few basically floor plates that I'm working from here um, uh, for uh, to basically to construct a Dragonfly building, and so I'm modeling just the kind of unique room floor plates here. These are, are essentially what are what are the inputs for my Dragonfly objects, uh, and each of these individual uh, room surfaces are being plugged into a component uh, that converts them into a Dragonfly room 2D. Um, and so, you know what? Bef because I'm going to come back to this, I'm just going to hit simulate on this right now. We have a recipe for Dragonfly annual energy use that's just like the uh, the energy use one that I I just demoed. Uh, so I'm just going to try pollinating this right now and sending this model to pollination. And I'm going to backtrack, and and uh, and you'll see. Uh, basically, let's see. I'll just open this so that we can come back to it in a second. Uh, right. So this, we're going to check the job on pollination, and then I'm going to explain this file that I'm running here. Uh, all right. So the simulation is running. We can check the debugger and see the progress there. 
Okay, so so the way this model is structured, right, we have these floor plates, we're converting these into room 2Ds, we're assigning different types of programs, so those these programs basically carry all those schedules and loads that define the usage of those individual rooms. Uh, we're assigning different ceiling heights to these, so not all the rooms need to have the same ceiling height, especially if you have plenty of spaces above them. Uh, and essentially, once we've created all these room 2D objects, we're bringing them all together, uh, and I'm separating them in by their floor elevation. And the reason why I'm doing that, sorry, I'm just going to bring up bifocals here so you can see the names of these components. Uh, the reason why I'm separating the, these components, uh, sorry, these rooms by their elevation is so that I can create a separate story object for each of these three kind of main areas that you see here. Uh, right, so I basically I have three branches of a grasshopper data tree. Each of them has, you know, the different number of rooms that correspond with that floor elevation. And I am essentially just intersecting the, you know, the polygons of that define those rooms so that we have matching segments between cars, you know, neighboring room to Ds. And then I'm solving adjacency, just like I would in Honeybee, between all those different room to Ds, uh, so that we have basically within a story, we have, uh, you know, uh, heat can flow from one room to another within that story. Um, and then essentially I'm giving like some different names to these. I'm creating the stories, giving them different names, giving them different uh, multipliers. So I'm basically saying that this bottom floor is repeated uh, four times over the height of the building. This middle floor is repeated six times. And this top floor is repeated 10 times, uh, you know, this, this tower. Um, and then so I have these story objects. I add some windows uh, to them. And so adding windows, as I said, is not is, you're not really adding detailed uh, individual face geometries uh, to describe those windows. In this case, we're just adding ratios. I'm adding different amounts of glass on the northeast, south, and west here. That's all that's happening. Uh, and then I'm joining all those objects into a dragonfly building. Uh, and then I'm using this component to basically separate what what which stories are basically have their their roof exposed to the outdoor air as opposed to just being uh, you know next to the the, uh, the the story above them. And then I'm um, uh, let's see I, I'm also separating that ground story so that it's in contact with the ground. Uh, you'll see I assigned a construction set. So in order to basically customize the constructions that I'm assigning to these. Uh, uh, this building, I'm, I'm creating a custom construction set, in this case with what looks like triple glazed glass, uh, so that you know I can test that energy conservation strategy. I'm assigning a nice, efficient HVAC system here that has a, uh, uh, a dedicated outdoor air system with fan coil units. You can think of this kind of like chilled beams, if uh, those of you are familiar with those, that's the type of system I'm simulating here. And we've got very good heat recovery, like an enthalpy wheel type of thing in this HVAC system. Then all of this, I have to join. I get, I'm getting a still that building object is what's coming out of here, but I'm joining the building along with this context shade that I have here that surrounds the building. All of that is getting joined into a dragonfly model uh, that you see coming out of here, uh, and it's this dragonfly model that can be plugged into the recipe that you saw me simulate earlier. So, so basically to show you what this building looks like, I'm going to turn the preview off on uh, on my input geometry. And you can see that basically be because of how we assign the multipliers to those different stories, right, this is what the building actually is going to look like at the end of the day uh, in, in Energy Plus. Uh, so you can see, right, we have those four stories on the ground and six stories in the middle, those 10 stories on top. It has the various different uh, programs that I'm, I'm coloring the rooms with right now. Uh, and you can see that those programs are determining things like the people per area or the uh, lighting density per area. Right, all these properties are being uh, set here, and I even like we have like the storage spaces are not conditioned, whereas the other spaces are. Uh, right, all this, all these properties are basically set within a single like like nice hierarchical dragonfly model. Uh, and to show you what this is finally, I mean these are still the 2D floor plates. What this is finally going to look like in Energy Plus, I can translate my dragonfly model over into a Honeybee format. Uh, and this will basically give you a, a sense of what that Honeybee model is, because we can preview that with all the Honeybee types of components here. So you can see that this, I, I can export that Dragonfly model into this format, which is kind of like a bare bones minimum number of geometries that are needed to represent this building. Uh, and you see, right, we're actually representing stories. These stories that are missing here are being represented via multipliers, because I set this option to use multiplier to true. I could just as easily set this to false. Uh, right, and then you'll see that it'll actually model the fully detailed geometry for every single story when I set this off to Energy Plus. Uh, I can also, you'll see that there are gaps in here because there are different ceiling heights across these different stories. But if I just set this add plenum to true, that'll make sure that, uh, that essentially that we get uh, zones without any uh, kind of loads or conditioning. 
those will be automatically added to the model here above each of the rooms. Uh, so right, so you can see a lot of these operations. Yes. Well, yeah, like we are at, we are at 1146. Yeah, so okay. Know, yeah, go. so in this case, I mean, this is really all that I want to show. So if we go and check this job on pollination now, um, yeah, you'll see that the kind of beauty of this is that because we actually only each story is a self-contained object, uh, you'll see that it was able to run each individual story on a separate CPU, uh, right? So this is actually the way the graph looks like. So this was able to scale, and we were able to run this model that has, uh, it's well over 100 zones. If you want, I can actually check for you how many rooms we have here. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely, maybe I'll just say it's well over 100, uh, right? And because we were able to run each individual story on a separate uh, worker, this was able to finish in, you know, in the time that I was walking you through this. So, I, you know, I think it was like five or seven minutes or something like that, uh, right? And again, just like the energy use recipe, we have an EUI JSON at the end of this. So this gives me the EUI of the entire building that I have here. Uh, right, and we get those end uses by different different areas. Um, maybe I'll just note that this this dragonfly model has all the same uh, uh, bells and whistles uh, that the that the honeybee energy use uh, recipe had, with the exception of we we don't have those reports yet. Those nice reports that I showed you uh, for coloring the rooms based on uh, on results in the browser. Uh, but yeah, but a lot of these other we have these other options where you can if you don't want to export each story to a separate model, you can export each building uh, or 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 you can export it all as a single Energy Plus model if you so desire. Uh, we have measures, additional strings, simulation parameters, all those are supported on this component. Um, and we have that option to use multiplier, right, that I showed you up here. Uh, basically, you can decide whether you want to use that or not in the simulation. Um, all right, I, there is one other, uh, um, basically, urban model that I was going to show here. It's, it's very, very, very similar, uh, but I know we're kind of towards the end of the uh, call here. Maybe I'll just say that, you know, you can use it for running urban scale models like this just as easily as you can run a skyscraper model. Um, you'll see in this case, I, I ran, I'm, I'm running the simulation uh, where each building is a separate Energy Plus model uh, instead of each story. Um, and, uh, and I can show you essentially what that looks like in the browser here. Um, so this is, I think this is the one I just showed you, but um, yeah, here we go. In this case, I had about 14 buildings in this district, and I can run each of those buildings on a separate worker. Uh, and at the end of it, I still I get that EUI JSON that gives me the average energy use intensity and the different end uses uh, for this urban district. Um, so again, I mean, this is just, this is working from the from building footprints workflow, and I'm happy to share these files at the end of this. A lot of them, uh, you'll, you'll already find uh, versions of these that download with the Food for Rhino installer that comes with Ladybug Tools, that for Ladybug Tools, uh, but we can also share them at the end here uh, for those of you who, who want to test this out for yourself on your machine. So with that, I'm going to open it up to questions, because uh, we have, we said we have 10 minutes left for Q&A, uh, and yeah, and thank you everybody again for joining for this. Okay, um, I don't see any questions, Chris, in the um, question box, but so any questions you guys have, it could be about pollination, it could be about what Chris just showed, um, we're happy to um, answer any questions or um, clarify anything that was unclear. Um, while we're waiting, I see we have a quiet audience today, but um, Chris, I was really actually, it was nice to see that reporting feature, and um, I'm really excited about that. Uh, I think it's going to be really useful to have a report feature that comes out of pollination from the cloud. Thanks, Chucky. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it, too. <laughs> Um, and certainly, yeah, if you guys, I, I, as I said, we only just push, the, push these recipes into onto the platform. So if you guys start testing them uh, over the next, uh, you know, uh, yeah. next day or a few days, please let us know in the forum uh, if you have any feedback on them. Yeah. I yeah. Prudence has a question. Yeah. Yes. Hey, thanks for, this is a great presentation. Um, my assistant Trevor has been messing around with you guys and I'm, I'm happy to see everything he's been telling me about live. So thank you for that. So one question that I have is um, for the HTML report that you guys have up there right now, not the, not the visualized stuff, but just the, you know, that one. Yeah. yeah. Is it possible to customize that at all? 
So, uh, I mean, basically, so th there's definitely customization for the units uh, mm -hmm. that, that I can say. So if you set the units that we have in for, for either the dragon, well, for especially for, because this is uh, uh, energy, honeybee energy only, if you set the units to IP, uh, all the results will be in KBTU per square foot, um, and, you know, the temperatures will be in Fahrenheit. Uh, so, yeah, so we have that level of customization. Uh, as far as th there is also the possibility, if, if there's a lot of demand for it, we can customize which uh, which uh, tabs show up here. So maybe uh, like another question is like, what do you want to customize here? If you want to customize, that's the question. Well, okay. So some sometimes if I'm dealing with a specific problem, and I want to show data like either for only a specific zone, or I want to be able to dive into the monthly data and just look at a few days. You know, like that, that's kind of the customization that I'm talking about, like changing the time parameters or changing yeah. which zones I'm looking at. So this is, this is, this is an open studio measure that mm -hmm. Chris said. So if there are like typical cases that you use over and over, you can go and edit that measure. Got it. And basically okay. use that measure instead of the default measure that we have. And then you get the customized version. Okay. That's great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and I what I was describing those are these are all inputs for the for the actual measure that are under the hood, like the ability to turn off any of these. If you don't care about a zone overview or something, you can you can turn those on or off, uh, or yeah, and change the units from it as well. So perfect. This is great. I'm I'm starting to think about how we're going to use this thing for passive house compliance. So that's what I wanted to hear. Yeah. Thanks, Prudence. Um, we did get a question from Cable um, about uh, having some errors. I would just suggest um, posting that to Discourse um, since it's a very specific um, error that you're seeing. And um, someone from our team can definitely get back to you on that. <clears throat> um, thanks. Thanks, Antoine, for posting that. Then we have another question here. Would it be possible to model a neighborhood level, 60 buildings or so, on pollination? Yeah, why not? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's what it's really built for. That's that's one of the main use cases of why we, we built Dragonfly. So, I mean, yeah. Like, I mean, this, for example, uh, sorry, not the skyscraper here, but the urban test. Um, right. Like, I mean, I know this is only 14 buildings, but it could very easily be, uh, you know, uh, 60, 100. I mean, just, yeah, just, just be aware that, you know, so you can set, you have the option to set each building or each story to run on a separate worker. Uh, and I think the current cap on pollination is, is around 100 workers. So, uh, you know, set, splitting it up by factor more than 100 uh, isn't, isn't necessarily going to result in any uh, speed. But, uh, you know, obviously it's going to run way faster on the cloud than, than it would uh, locally. So I think one uh, key point of this question was like he or she is interested in energy exchange between different building functions. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that might be a good question for the forum to, to discuss like, uh, like the, the, whole, the whole urban up thing and like where are we going yeah. with this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. NREL is working on on stuff that would allow us to kind of model those types of district systems. But um, yeah, but that's a yeah, it's a question for the forum. Yeah. Okay, and Mava, the link to the forum is in the chat box. Okay. Well, um, we don't have any other questions. We have about five minutes left. Um, we can end early, I think, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us. If there's no other questions, um, yeah, we'll see you guys on Discourse or um, on social, uh, LinkedIn and other platforms. Right, thank you everyone, take care. This Thanks, recording will be posted on YouTube um, as soon as it's ready. Okay. Awesome. All right. Thank you all.